Okay, well, we'll carry on with our readings from John James Taylor's account of his visit to Transylvania in 1868. And I'll introduce this section with another short video which I took in the church in Torda immediately prior to the start of the service in 2018 at the 450th anniversary. At the close of the week we returned to Klausenberg to prepare for our return home. But we had fresh hospitalities to experience and our kind friends would gladly have kept us longer with them. All the strangers who had visited the Unitarians of Klausenberg have left photographs behind them in the chamber of the consistory. I was requested to do the same. I should hardly have noticed the circumstance, but for the opportunity it affords me of alluding to the photographic institution at Klausenberg. It is by far the completest of any that I have ever yet seen, in the propriety and elegance of its arrangements exceeding even those of London. It stands in a beautiful garden on the outskirts of the town. Another object deserving of notice in Klausenberg is the museum. We visited it twice. The present director is Mr. Brasse, an Unitarian, a man of varied attainments, curator of the College of the Unitarians and a member of the Hungarian Academy. The house was formerly a seat of Count Miko a leading member of the Reform Communion just outside Klausenberg, which, with the beautiful grounds in which it stands, commanding a delightful view of the richly wooded valley of the Samosh, was presented by that nobleman with a munificent liberality to the public. It contains well-arranged specimens of the natural, particularly the mineral, products of Transylvania, with a small collection of pictures and portraits of distinguished men. The Department of Antiquities, under the charge of its special curator, Mr. Fanale, is particularly interesting. Transylvania, as part of the old province of Dacia, is very rich in remains of the Romans, who extensively worked its mines. This collection is filled with monuments of their former presence in the country. Here are deposited the waxen tablets ascribed to the second century which were found a few years ago in some adjoining gold mines, accompanied by a braid of hair. There are three of them. The first contains a bond for loan and payment of interest. The second is a contract between an employer and a workman. The third, from its imperfect condition, is undecipherable. Apparently, for greater security, these documents exist in a double form, written outside as well as within the tablet. On Sunday morning we attended service in the Unitarian Church in Klausenberg. A young candidate preached. The audience was not numerous. There was probably some exhaustion after the excitement of the foregoing week. The women and the men sat in different parts of the church and the further end fronting the entrance was filled with the pupils and teachers of the gymnasium and 
college. The service was very simple. In the predominance of the sermon over every other part, much resembling that of the Protestant churches in Germany. In the afternoon we had been invited to dine with Mr Kellerman, a fine old gentleman and a zealous Unitarian, on the celebration of his 76th birthday. He had been steward to Baron Vesselini and left guardian of his children. This trust he had executed with such ability and faithfulness that he not only freed the estate from all encumbrances, but presented each of the sons on coming of age with a handsome sum of ready money. His country house, where he is enjoying his old age and its universal respect in rural ease and abundance, is situated at Suchak, in a beautiful wooded valley about 10 or 12 miles from Klausenberg. We approach it over dilapidated bridges and most primitive roads, that must have tried the springs of Mr Padgett's carriage fearfully. Mr Kellerman received us at the entrance of his ground with that frank and unaffected courtesy which is characteristic of the Hungarians, and taking my daughter under his arm, led us to the part of the garden where the rest of his guests were assembled. He had invited about sixty. The were representatives of most of the Unitarian families in the neighbourhood including the professors of Klausenberg, as well as others. It was an excellent opportunity of seeing something in its native genuine form of the profuse hospitality of Hungary. The company was dispersed in groups over the picturesque but somewhat wild and orchard-like garden, some sitting in the sheltered arbour and partaking of the cake and liqueur which in this country always precede a dinner. At dinner, we were distributed through different apartments of the building in the grounds at some distance from his proper residence. The hale old man, assisted by his niece, presiding with wonderful vigour and vivacity at the head of the principal table, and telling his guests that he hoped to see them again on a similar occasion that day ten years. A gypsy band was stationed in an adjoining room and music and speeches flowed on in unintermitted stream till the end of the feast. I was seated next to the bishop. In the course of the afternoon he turned round to me quite unexpectedly and addressed me very fluently in Latin, expressing in the kindest terms his fraternal regard for the English Unitarians, his grateful sense of the services material and spiritual which they had rendered to the churches of Transylvania and his hearty good wishes for my own and my daughter's safe return to our native shores, weaving into his speech a graceful use of the well-known Horatian words, Narvis qua tibi creditum debes, etc. I ought to have made a brief acknowledgement in Latin, which I could have done without much difficulty, had I been sufficiently collected. But I was taken so completely by surprise, and was so really touched by the kindness of his language and manner, that I rose impromptu to utter my thanks in German, and am only too sensible that I delivered myself in a very confused and imperfect manner. I was told, however, that I was quite understood. To make amends, I afterwards sent the bishop a few words in Latin, conveying more briefly and precisely what I had wished and meant to say. The day's festivities concluded with a ball, and we were glad to have an opportunity at last of seeing a Hungarian dance. It's full of life and expression, a great contrast to our cold and conventional movements. The gentlemen dance in Hessian boots, which form a part of the Hungarian full dress, and in their vigorous, animated footing, make a considerable noise on the floor and raise no little dust. On leaving Mr Kellerman's hospitable abode, we found a party of Wallach peasants dancing to a gypsy band at his gates. Their gesticulations were the wildest that can be conceived, quite in harmony with the music which inspired them. We drove home by moonlight and reached Klausenberg without any mishap. Well, we'll leave our readings here and continue again tomorrow. Thank you for watching.